In this chapter, we're going to be dealing with electric circuits. Specifically, for now, we'll stick with circuits that are comprised of just batteries and resistors. In previous classes, you might have learned to deal with electric circuits by reducing your resistors into a single equivalent resistor using things like the if you're in series you add up all your resistance if you're in parallel you would add up all the reciprocal of the resistance and then you keep on reducing until you get one single uh, resistance left then you can solve it and expand everything back out however this method only works all the way as long as you only have one source because you can only describe things being in series or in parallel with respect to the source if you have two sources as you have in this question you can see source here and source here then it becomes a little more difficult to say which resistor is in series and which resistor is in parallel if you look from the perspective of V1 it looks like R1 and R2 is in series whereas R1 and R3 would be in parallel because you can go here or here but from the perspective of V2 it looks like that R1 and R3 is in fact in series whereas R2 is the one in parallel so instead of arguing about that all day we move on to using a more general approach which is Kirchhoff's rules and Kirchhoff's rules is basically two separate rules one dealing with current which is the junction rule and then one dealing with voltage which is the loop rule so the junction rule says basically any point in the circuit usually we pick the points where you have branching happening such as this point all the current coming into that point is equal to all the per current going out of that point or you can if you wish to get the zero on the one side you can say current in minus current out it's equal to zero it's completely arbitrary what you put positive in terms of in versus out. And that's always true. That's basically a statement of conservation of charge because if you have a point where you have current coming in but no current going out or there's a difference, then you're continually building up charge, which in a circuit, you know that that doesn't happen. And then there's the loop rule, which applies to if you go any single loop, if you add up all your potentials, you gain, you loss, you gain, you loss, it must add up to zero. This is basically a statement of conservation of energy. Uh, for a given charge going around, say starting from here, moving this way and back to that same point after it gets to the battery, it must have exactly the same potential as before. Otherwise, as you go through the loop again and again and again, you get more and more energy or you have less and less energy and that also does not make sense in terms of a circuit and that's Kirchhoff's rules and we apply this to general circuits the approach is actually very recipe like and it very much and it very quickly becomes an exercise in linear algebra more than anything else but here the focus is to use the physics to set up the equations first the rest is math we'll still do it but the focus is how to set it up so basically, there's a few steps to follow when you use Kirchhoff's rules. Step one is to label the current. And since we have no clue where all the direction of the current is going on the outset, we basically at this point just assume a certain direction. And that direction will be important as we put it into our Kirchhoff's rules equations. So that's why it's important to define and choose a direction. You could be wrong. You end up with a negative number, and then you know that you flip it around. But you have to pick one already. Why on the outside, you look at each component, and then you start labeling currents. Let's call that I1. And then because this is in series, this must have the same current. So we can already save ourselves some work. And instead of coming up with one current for every component and then try and find equation, we know some stuff equals each other. And then for the next component, so this R1 here will have a different current. So let's call that I2 and we'll assume that it goes downwards because, you know, following this battery and around. Then just for fun, we'll also say that the current here goes down, giving me the current in that resistor that way, which is an inconceivable seeing how this battery 
V1 is a little stronger than V2, so it could overpower it and have it pump the other way. Okay, that was the first step. We assume our direction. Step two, we start putting down some equation based on the junction rule. And we do that at each split point that we have. Uh, some may be redundant, so we'll drop those. In this particular circuit, there's only two split points, one here and one here. And for each one of them, we will write a junction rule. Uh, so let's see, the in and the out. So here we have I1 going into that point, I2 coming out. So we'll put minus I2, and then I3 also come out of that point. So that's I3. All adds up to zero. And then down here, you'll find that you have I1 flowing out plus I2 going in and I3 going in, which is equal to zero. And that's what I mean by redundant, because the top point and the bottom point are more or less mirror image of each other. So they give you the same equation. They don't give you anything new. So there, we have one equation so far. So we'll call that equation J1 for junction one, just to keep our heads straight, because there'll be a couple more equations coming up. Once you get the junction rule done, then the third step is to do the loop rules. And typically what we do is we do what's called open panes. So think of this circuit kind of like a window and we want a single piece of glass. We don't want to include any frame in it. So uh, one loop could look like this, call that loop one. And then the second loop, we will go loop two here like that, making sure you have a direction. What we mean by open panes or the counter example to an open pane would be a loop that goes like this all the way around. You see how it includes like a branch in the middle, so it's not really a single piece of glass in that sense. We like to avoid that just because it might give us a chance to generate redundant information and we might miss something otherwise. But if you do every single open pane, you would be okay. And don't forget to choose a direction to go around the loop because that direction is going to decide whether or not we're going to have potential gain or potential drop as we go around this loop. So for L1, let's just pick a place to start. Usually you start at kind of the battery. So let's start there and go up like that. And you see that you are moving from the negative terminal of the battery to the positive terminal. So you're getting a voltage gain as you go through the battery. So that's a positive gain in voltage. And then you come around and you hit R1 with the current going down. So whenever you have a resistor, it takes energy out of the circuit. So you can have a voltage drop or potential drop based on its current and its resistance, V equals IR. And then we follow through the rest of the loop and we go through this resistance R2 and we're back where we started. So that must mean all that adds up to zero. In this loop, we gain some potential as we move through the battery, come around, we lose some potential as we come around R1, and then we lose some more to get back to the same spot. That's L1. L2, okay, let's start at the battery again, and we follow the same loop again, except this time, you see that we're going from the positive to the negative. So we're gonna get a potential drop in this case. We're gonna drop this will be negative 1.4 volts as we go through the loop. And then we go through the loop. We have minus I3 R3 because we're going through a resistor. It, it takes out energy away from the circuit. And then as we come back up, we're going through this resistor, but the direction we're going through the loop is opposite the direction that we have assumed the current to be. Since it's easier to deal with just the magnitude, we're gonna change the voltage drop to a voltage gain. And this is the crucial bit about assuming directions, both with the current and the loop, because if the loop is in the opposite direction of the current, then when you go through that resistor, basically the two negative becomes a positive, so you don't get a voltage drop, you get a voltage gain. If you don't get that sign right, everything's going to fall apart. So there, in this case, we have three equations and look, we have three unknowns. We are solving for all the current. This is basically up to this point. That's where the physics gets us. And then the rest of this question will be very much about the math and solving it. Of course, you can already see 
these are all linear equations, so if you know linear algebra, you can probably set up a matrix and get it done fairly quickly. But with three equations, you can almost fairly quickly do it just using substitution, and that's what I'll do. So given the three equation then, what's the best strategy to go about solving all of these? First, you want to try and find the equation with only one unknown, but unfortunately that's not happening here because there's two unknown here and two unknown there, and three unknowns up at the top, so you definitely want, don't want to touch that J1 equation. But you do notice that in the other two, you have I1 and I2, and this one you have I3 and I2, so the common thread there is I2. So conceivably, if we can make each one of these equations to get us I1 in terms of I2 and I3 in terms of I2, we can bring it all back up to the J1 equation to get us just one equation with I2, then we can solve everything. So from the L1 equation, we're going to use that to solve for I1. So we'll pop this over to the other side and divide by R2 to get us that. Then from the L2 equation, we're going to solve for I3 similarly, and we'll get that. So then putting these back into the J1 equation, we'll get that. And now the only unknown is I2, so we try and expand and collect like terms. Putting everything with I2 on the one side, be careful with all the various negative signs that are lurking about. Then of course the I2 factors out and you get to solve for I2. Plugging in the numbers and remembering that the kilo ohm it means a thousand ohms, 0.6 milliamps. Then once we have this number, we plug it back into here and here to get my I1 and I3. More calculated work and you will get 0.4 milliamps and negative 0.2 milliamps. Well this negative, all that means is just that we got the wrong direction. So then if we go back up here, we can see that instead of I3 being flowing to the left, I3 should really flow to the right. And that's it. We have all the magnitude and direction for part A.